Hello, everybody. Welcome to Totally Tabled. My name is Shaggy, and today I'm doing my top 10 cooperative board games that I personally prefer to play solo. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that these are bad multiplayer. I just would personally rather play them solo for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into. And I've organized the list, so my number one is the game I'd most want to play solo. And in fact, as you get to the top of this list, it's pretty much the only way I'm going to play these games. Okay, okay, enough talk. Let's get into it. My number 10 is Dorf Romantic. This is a cozy tile laying game based on the cozy video game, of course. The great thing about this one is it starts very simple. You're just trying to grow certain regions to a specific size in order to fulfill these goals. And there's really very few restrictions on how you can place tiles. But as you finish playing games, you unlock more stuff that you get to add to the game, kind of like a legacy game. There's all these twists to the rules and new restrictions and different goals you need to meet, which just keeps the game fresh. I have Dorf Romantic at number 10 on the list because I do enjoy playing it with two players. But ultimately, it's one of these co-op games where when you play with more players, you're just taking turns solving the same puzzle. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, that can be great fun when the puzzle is very complicated or, you know, multifaceted in some way, kind of like an escape room or something. But here, the puzzle is so light, I'd personally rather just make the decisions myself. So anyway, that's number 10, Dorf Romantic. Number 9 is The Lost Expedition. This is a simple card game that you can play solo or cooperatively with two players. And pretty much everything I just said about Dorf Romantic applies here. The two player game works fine, but for me, this survival puzzle is just more satisfying to tackle alone. You can check out my playthrough to see it in action. This is actually one of the first videos I ever made, so you can see how much has changed over the last three years. But basically, the way it works is you're playing these really beautiful tarot cards into a line, one at a time. Sometimes playing cards from your hand and sometimes from the deck. And once you have six of them out, you're going to resolve them in order from left to right. You really need to collect these resources and then use them to avoid all these deadly events that can happen. Things like animal attacks and bad weather or illnesses. And thematically, you're searching the Amazon for El Dorado. And certain cards will let you get closer to your goal. And really, you just need to survive until then. The heart of the puzzle is all about this resource management and just puzzling out how to sequence the cards so your actions will trigger in the best order. That's really the kind of puzzle that I want to be in complete control over. I want to figure it out on my own. You know, it's really a one-person job, and having two is just, you know, just too many cooks in the kitchen. But there you go. That's number nine, The Lost Expedition. Number eight is Sleeping Gods. I'm probably in the minority on this one. I'm sure most people would say that this is best at two or three players. And I agree, it works great as a two-player experience. The fact you have nine characters to manage in your party, you know, I completely understand why a lot of people would want to split up that responsibility. To be fair, it's not like each of those characters is taking their own turn or have their own actions or something, and so it's not difficult to manage those nine characters. But really, for me, the reason I think Sleeping Gods is a better solo experience is because it's all about adventure and exploration. The sandbox nature of the game means you can sail off into any direction, and that's a decision that I want to make myself. I don't find it very fun to discuss you know, these kinds of choices, these nebulous choices with another player. You know, it's like, hey, do you want to go north or east? You know, do you want to visit this town or go over and explore this forest? There's no right answer there. And usually one person ends up making that choice anyway and kind of dominating those decisions. I'd much prefer to be in control and chart my own path. Now, I made a full playthrough series on Sleeping God, so you can go check that out to kind of see what I mean. But there you go. That's my number eight, Sleeping Gods. Number seven is Voidfall. Now, I'm sure I'm in the minority on this one. And this is a little bit of a cheat because Voidfall can actually be played 
cooperatively, competitively, or solo. And it's probably mostly played as a competitive game. But I personally prefer the solo to all of those modes. And by prefer, I mean it's really the only way I've played and the only way I want to play. Now, despite this being one of my favorite games of all time and my game of the year of 2023, it's at number seven because I wouldn't turn down a multiplayer game. I'm sure the cooperative game is great. This one really comes down to personal preference because I find this puzzle so deep and intricate and I have such a great time sitting there and pondering out my turn. I'd kind of just much prefer to be alone in my thoughts and not be uh, distracted by someone else or, you know, be hurried along. I, this is a game I want analysis paralysis. I want to have the time to be able to think out each turn and try to come up with the perfect plan. The puzzle is just that compelling to me. If you haven't checked it out, I've covered this game extensively, done a full playthrough, talked about it at length in my, you know, top 10 games of the year for 2023. This is a space 4 x e kind of game, or maybe 3.5X, which really focuses on deep strategic mechanisms. And one of my favorite things about the solo game is that you have to deal with these crisis events each turn. It's just these little things that can throw a satisfying tactical wrench into your long-term plans, forcing you to either change course a little bit in order to deal with it or put off dealing with it and possibly dealing with some consequences later. It's a great system that adds a lot of tension to the solo game. There you go. That's Voidfall, my number seven. Number six is The Loop. The Loop is a really quirky, underrated cooperative deck building game with a focus on combo-rific card play and these really fun, satisfying mega turns. There's a wacky time travel theme going on where you're fighting off Dr. Foe and his legion of clones throughout time. You can check out my playthrough to see exactly how that all works. But there's a really clever, puzzly game going on here. Kind of brain burnery, requires a ton of planning and thinking ahead, and it's just so much more difficult with more players. It's clear at this point that there are just some puzzles that I just would rather do myself. And I don't know, I just find this one so intricate, it's just hard to share all that planning and get on the same page with someone else. I also really love how they changed the solo game up a little bit. You can play with either two, three, or four characters, but what you do is you take their deck of cards and you shuffle them together to form one deck. And then you draw out the cards until one of the characters has three cards, and then that's the character that gets to go. That little subtle change really adds a lot to the gameplay. It improves the game, in my opinion, and just is my preferred way to play. So there you go, that's number six, The Loop. Number five is Siberion, but really this could apply to the entire Oniverse series of games. Each game in the series is one or two player, but they always felt to me like solo games where the two player mode was kind of shoehorned in. Some games in the series do it better than others. There's so many choices for cooperative games that you can play at two. I don't want to play one where it just feels like I'm doing half of a single puzzle. And that's what I feel with the Oniverse series. These are such great solo experiences. They feel complete, and there's just no reason for another player to be along. Now, I will mention that I have said this sort of stuff in the past and gotten some pushback from people who say that, no, actually, they play great at two. There's plenty of people who prefer these at two. Uh, it, it just doesn't work for me. But again, as a solo series, it's fantastic. So that's my number five, Siberion but really the entire Oniverse series. Number four is the Sprawlopolis series, which includes Sprawlopolis, Agropolis, and my favorite, Natureopolis. Nice and quick tile laying game where you're placing out these cards, trying to score points based on three random objectives. It's just so quick and easy and replayable. It's got that addictive quality where you don't wanna just play it once, you're just gonna shuffle it back up and play again. I'll make this quick because, again, this is the same thing as the Oniverse games, the same thing as Dorf Romantic. When you're playing multiplayer, it just feels like you're taking a puzzle fit for one player and splitting it into parts. Taking turns, 
And that's not what I want from a multiplayer cooperative experience. And I completely understand why these games sort of try to shoehorn in these multiplayer modes. We usually talk about it in the reverse way where solo modes are being shoehorned in. I think a lot of these games are examples of the opposite, where we're trying to shoehorn in multiplayer modes into what is really a solo experience. No reason to bring it out in a crowd. That's my number four, Sprawlopolis. Number three is Frostpunk. I've talked about Frostpunk a ton, so I won't belabor it here. You can go watch my full solo playthrough. This was my game of the year of 2022. A fantastic board game adaptation of the popular video game. It's a heavy, epic, brutal survival city building game. And it just absolutely nails the bleak setting. Throughout these games, you're going to be faced with moral decisions, you know, fascinating stories that are going to force you to make hard choices that are going to have consequences. And it's, again, one of those things where I don't want to share that decision making with anyone else. I want to be able to make those decisions to feel like I'm the leader of this city. You know, the buck stops with me. Now, the way they divide the responsibilities amongst multiple players in the game is pretty clever. It almost involves a kind of role playing where you're going to split up responsibilities for making certain decisions. Almost as if each player is role-playing an advisor or a head of a, a certain governmental department. And, you know, if you're in a group and you're up for kind of role-playing that, then I could see how that could be fun. But it's just not for me. Not for this game. This really just might be a personal preference thing. And, you know, maybe it's me. But I think there's a reason why the video game was single-player. And for me, that's how I want the board game as well. So there you go, that's Frostpunk, number three. Number two is This War of Mine. Again, this is one of my favorite games of all time and I talk about it a lot. This is a survival game where you play as citizens caught in the middle of a war, just trying to survive the physical and mental toll. It's very story forward and the stories can be very depressing, very graphic absolutely harrowing at times and force you to make some really gut-wrenching decisions. It's board gaming at its most profound, and that's the sort of thing that I'd prefer to experience alone. Unlike Frostpunk, This War of Mine doesn't do a really good job of disguising its multiplayer mode. You're literally just passing off responsibility for making decisions in a very blunt, obvious way. This is the definition of a single player game that is just being chopped up to shoehorn in a multiplayer mode. More players add nothing to the experience. You're not splitting up characters or anything like that. You're just taking over for different phases of the game. So it's really a theme that works better alone and mechanisms that are just sort of annoying to share with other people. This is one where I just will not play it multiplayer. I've never played a multiplayer. I have zero desire to. And as a solo game, it's one of the very best games that's ever been made. It truly is a meaningful experience like no other. There you go, my number two, This War of Mine. And my number one cooperative board game that I prefer to play solo is Mage Knight. Mage Knight is another game that has both competitive and cooperative scenarios. But I don't care about any of that because I am only playing this game solo. I mean, this game is as relevant and popular as ever after over a dozen years, mainly because of its embrace by the solo community. And I've used the word puzzle a lot in this list. This is almost just a list of examples of puzzle games that I just don't want to share with other people. Mage Knight is the ultimate example of a game that is an efficiency puzzle at its heart, a truly demanding and unforgiving one, and I just enjoy these kinds of games by myself. It's really my favorite type of solo game. I enjoy staring at my hand of cards and trying to figure out how best to play them. And that's really what this game is all about, because everything you do is done with cards. You know, you're going to be moving around and exploring, fighting off different monsters and sieging castles. And it's all done by playing these multi-use cards from your hand that can be upgraded using uh, mana as a resource. Mage Knight excels by making you feel like there's so much you could do with your hand of cards. 
You just feel like you have an abundance of choice and really trying to figure out that perfect turn and and squeeze every last drop of potential out of your cards. That's why this game is so beloved. And I just don't think more players really adds to that experience. That's my number one, Mage Knight. So there we have it, 10 cooperative games that I prefer solo. Stay tuned in the future because I'm going to do another video going over my top 10 cooperative games that I prefer multiplayer. But the truth is, most cooperative games are equally great solo and multiplayer. Are there any games that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. But that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.